I worry about it. I think it's going to be a crisis in the future. I believe we are hitting, hitting thresholds of just too much debt. Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is BlackRock's CEO, Larry Fink. If you're as excited about exploring the fascinating world of cryptocurrencies as we are, hit that subscribe button now. Don't miss out on our insightful discussions, market updates, and game-changing insights that could potentially shape your financial future. Remember to give us a thumbs up if you find our content valuable. This structural inflation is unlike anything, and, and I think business leaders and politicians are not providing uh, the foundation to help explain this. We have not seen inflation like this in over 30 years. Actually, I was a young bond trader uh, during the late 70s and, and where we had hyperinflation. I don't, I don't think we're going to have anything close to the inflation of the 70s, but we have so much deeper structural inflation and and we are underestimating what what this the change in geopolitics mm. is so structurally inflationary when 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 I was in Davos earlier this year I heard the phrase national security uttered everywhere and quite frankly I never heard those phrases uttered that often before mm. that in all my years. so national security for chips or food or energy, obviously energy, and all these issues. And the question is, at what cost? And right. nobody answers that question, at what cost? Well, you said politicians, governments, they need to do a better job of, of, of explaining this, of talking. What would that actually look like? Well, I mean, they have to recognize if we are going to f uh, focus on um, if, if the, whole uh, uh, the whole idea about restricting immigration. Big topic here in Germany. Big topic in the United States. Um, we are down in the United States, oh, close to 3 million legal immigrants. We've changed the immigration policy. At the same time, there's so many job needs. And in the United States, we've had close to a trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus just beginning its J-curve. Mm. And th these are huge job creators. And at the same time, we have restricted uh, immigration and as a result of it, you know, we see more wage pressure. So at what cost? We have in the United States a very protracted uh, strike between the auto workers and the auto companies. It has been reported that the, the union is asking for a 40% increase. So at what cost? What, you know, in the long run, what does that mean for jobs? Do mo yeah. more jobs move? This is the conversation we're having now. Um, we are, t you know, because of the invasion of Ukraine and the realization in Europe, especially here in Germany, of the dependency in Russian gas, mm. every boardroom is asking themselves, where are our other dependencies? Globalization is still intact. It's just being reimagined. Um, so whether we have our supply chains out of China, now we're moving them to Vietnam, Philippines, Eastern Europe, Turkey, uh, India, Mexico is, is one of the real destinations for North American demand. And so this is not global, by no means globalization is over. But as we reimagine these supply chains, there's a reason why so many supply chains were so embedded in China because that for years and years and years was the cheapest, mm. easiest place to do it. And so in many cases, we're moving supply chains at higher costs. Yes, especially if you're onshoring, on, onshoring to either Europe or the US where you're having these labor conversations. But you may have, all of this means is we're going to be more aggressively moving towards technology to add more productivity, whether it is pro, uh, using more robotics, AI, mm. all of this is going to, in the long run, that's what I'm saying, markets go up and down. We have big changes. We have big changes in, in labor. Uh, we have higher wages. In the long run, companies adapt, businesses adapt. Right. But the biggest issue for me, and I say this to every governmental leader I see worldwide, what, what the world is missing today is hope. Mm. I see more fear. So in this era of fear, of no hope, are we headed for Well, there's not right no now? hope. It's all, I, you know, Let's I'm hopeful. Hope. Let's hope. Larry's hopeful. We're <laughs> okay. happy about that. But does that mean we are headed for a recession right now? 
So I think we have to analyze that by each region because the United States, um, our home mortgage market is based on a 30-year mortgage. So anybody who has a home mortgage, higher interest rates does not impact them. And so the transmission of high elevated interest rates in the U.S. takes much longer to impact the economy. Whereas in other places where you have more floating rate, or like in the United Kingdom where you have generally a five-year fixed and then it resets. And so let's assume 20% of the mortgages have to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, reevaluated at a higher level, that creates more immediacy than higher rates. So I think we're going to see some economies enter recessions early. Which ones would that be? Well, I think Europe... Just any ones more sensitive to... The, the ones that are more sensitive to this elevated interest rates. And you're, and you're starting to see a real decline uh, in GDP and other... You know, they're, they're basically flat now, but can they go into a, a more protracted recession. Whatever the recessions we're going to have, they're going to be quite modest. So I'm yeah. not even that fearful. But can the I, other issue... I have but, a stat for Let me just say fear. one thing, yes, Danny. Yes, then, I'll, then I'll inject okay, the fear. Okay, but, but, I, but I believe <laughs> if we have labor shortages, if we're if getting back to this whole social issue of how are we going to be doing this, in many areas you may need a recession to bring down labor demand. And so... And I think this is one of the things that's going to impact in the United States. You still have a very vibrant economy. The United States, and, the, and the, as I said, the J-curve of the Infrastructure Act, the CHIPS Act, the IRA, which has huge implications, um, that's going to be creating jobs. And so it may require a more protracted Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. And it may mean by 2025, the, uh, the United States economy may be entering a recession. But I don't see it any time in the near term. So throughout history of U.S. growth slowdowns, we have underestimated every single one of them. Are you confident we're not making that same mistake again? Look, if central banks can overshoot. If fear becomes worse, then consumers pull back and the recessions are going to become more protracted. We have elections in so many places of the world. We have an election in the United States. We have all that stuff. You know, we are going to have many uh, political candidates who are going to provide a lot of fear, Yes. unfortunately. And I think the winner, I think the political winner is the one who provides the most hope for the future or what people believe with the hope you, in the future. Do you see that, though? Do I'm you see anyone get, projecting I'm, hope? I, I dearly hope so. I'm projecting hope. <laughs> <laughs> Larry for president? I don't know. No, no I'm, um, I'm too young. <laughs> that is... <laughs> 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 that is very true. Um, look, you make an excellent point. I think half, half of the population is going to be in an election next year. Yeah. Could we then have a recession based on what you're saying, not by a monetary accident, but by a fiscal accident? I, I, so in my travel scene, um, governmental leaders, I talk about the need for more public-private investing, whether it is in infrastructure, sustainability, whatever you want to say, power grids. What I see is most democracies are having elevated fiscal deficits. I worry about it. I think it's going to be a crisis in the future. I believe we are hitting, hitting thresholds of just too much debt. The only solution we have now is reorient and reimagining how we finance growth. Mm. And I think the way we're going to be able to finance growth is public private. There's so much private money that is looking for great long term investments to work, whether that is in power grids or infrastructure, uh, in sustainability, charging stations, you name it. Um, you know, and, 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 and so. In all our conversations is how can we reimagine finance? How can we find a better structure? And how can we then leverage public finance mm. with private capital to augment growth? Right. And this is going to be the big key for the next 10 years. Can I ask about how you're thinking about that at BlackRock? Because you're already, you're already the world's largest asset manager. So, so what is your goal now? 
Look, at, I had, my, our goal is to provide a better, better financial future for more human beings. Um, all our money is not, not, a, not a single euro dollar is our money. 100% of our money is our clients' money. We have to do what our clients are looking to do. And I think we are a really good fiduciary that we work really well with our clients. We give them long-term views. I really, when they ask me what's going on in the market, I really don't <laughs> have a good answer because I don't really care about the day-to-day. -day. Your business, you care about the day-to-day -day business. I mean, our job is to, prov is to give st opportunities for long-term investors that they can earn a return and that they can have a healthy life in the future with dignity. Right. And that's I mean, our job. And, and so if we can provide that advice to give more people hope with dignity in retirement, then I think we're going to earn more share wallet. I do care about the day-to-day, -day, Larry, but I also, <laughs> I, know the, I, know the, I know the history. And one that stands out is, is 2009. You buy BGI, you buy iShares, 6.6 .6 billion. It was the Louisiana purchase of asset management. And, and apologies for all the non-Frenchies and Americans in the audience. You might have to explain to them what the Louisiana purchase is. But in other words, it was big, it was transformative. Will you ever do a deal like that again? You think something so transformative for BlackRock? Well, I mean, when we did that deal, uh, Many uh, reporters in the commentary said we're already too big and we were 2.9 trillion then and now we're 9.5 trillion. Um, and, and so the answer is yes, we are, we believe we have great opportunities to transform our company again. I am very excited about change. Um, let me be clear, we are as neurotic today as we were when we started the company 35 years ago. We're having a great time working with our clients, and we have, I do see some very large opportunities for inorganic growth. Yeah, because what, what would be today's equivalent of ETFs in 2009 that are on the verge of this explosive growth? Oh my gosh, I mean, I, getting back to this whole idea of working with governments, public, private, it may not have that type of trillion dollars of ex explosive growth, but I do believe we can help make a difference in building better societies. We can prepare societies better, working with governments in terms of preparedness for elevated temperatures in the world. Um, you know, we believe we are going to have to move more rapidly towards decarbonization. We believe that hydrocarbons, by the way, are going to be with us for a long, long time. And that's why we're working with energy companies, mm -hmm. not against energy companies. That is why we said do not ever divest of hydrocarbons, which the far left doesn't agree with me. But in many cases, the far right disagrees with me. And so I guess we're doing something right when I'm getting attacked from both sides. But yes, that is the measure, I think. <coughs> attacks everywhere. Well, look, I mean, these, these are massive global threats, right? And, and they do require a level of trust. So how do you gain trust from the skeptics, especially with some of the political dialogue happening in America? By doing the right thing every day, by making sure that, we, that the skeptic truly understand what we're doing. In many cases, they don't, many people don't care what we're doing. They just are using us as a vehicle. But the most important thing, we provide choice for every client. We work with every client. It is not our money. And we work with them to try to have each and every client have, a, you know, have options and choice. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Larry Fink. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.